Grace and peace to you, and welcome in person and online for the third Sunday of Easter. Today we return once again to Easter Day, uh, this time to Easter evening, to hear the famous story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus who meet Jesus along the way. So we'll be focusing our readings and our hymns on dining with the divine.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. 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 Amen. The grace of our risen and victorious Lord, the love of our God who raised him, and the communion of the Holy Spirit which he gives to us be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, as you bless your people of the past by dining with them, bless us also this day by joining us around the table we set in your name, believing that in your presence we will be nurtured in heart, soul, and mind, enlightening our thinking and inspiring a radical compassion and hospitality that sends us out to respond faithfully and effectively to the pernicious hungerings of our time. We come to take our place with you. Come now and take your place with us. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. A reading from Genesis. Now Adonai, the Lord, was seen by Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as Abraham sat at the entrance of his tent during the hottest part of the day. Abraham looked up and almost could not believe what he saw. There were three men standing there in the sun opposite his tent. When Abraham saw them, he jumped up and ran from the tent entrance to meet them, bowing down to the ground and saying, My lords, please. If I find favor with you, please do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me fetch a little bread that you may refresh your hearts, and after that you may pass on, for you have, after all, passed your servant's way. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham ran back into the tent to tell his wife Sarah quickly, Take three full measures of our choicest flour and knead it to make cakes. Then Abraham ran out to the oxen and took a young ox, tender and good, and gave it to a servant who quickly made it ready to be ready for the feast. Then Abraham ran and got cream and milk and the young ox that he had prepared and set it before the three men. Abraham stood across the way from them under the tree while the three men ate. Then the three men said to Abraham, Where is your wife, Sarah? And Abraham said, There, in the tent. Then one of the three men said, I will return. Yes, return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind the man. Now Abraham and Sarah were rather old, old enough that Sarah was beyond the age of showing any indication that she was still able to become pregnant. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I become worn out, is there to be pleasure for me? And even my Lord is old. But Adonai, the Lord, said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything beyond Adonai, the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season. And, and Sarah shall have a son. But then Sarah pretended, saying, No, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. But he said, Oh, no, indeed, you laugh. The word of the Lord. God. We say responsibly. Um, excuse me. Psalm 145. Adonai the Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. Adonai the Lord upholds all who are fallen and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you. And you give them their food in due season. You will open your hands, satisfying the desire of every living thing. Adonai the Lord is just in all his ways 
and kind in all his doings. Adonai, the Lord, is near to all who follow him, to all who follow him in the truth. He fulfills the desires of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Adonai, the Lord, watches over all who love him, but all who wicked and evil will destroy My mouth will speak the praise of Adonai, the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. A reading from Luke. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. So Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, learned that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, and she came and brought an alabaster jar of ointment into the dining room. The woman then stood behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, and she began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus to lunch saw what was happening, he said to himself, Ha! If Jesus really was a prophet, he would know who this woman is and what kind of woman is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered the Pharisee's thoughts, saying, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, the Pharisee replied, speak. Jesus said, There was a certain creditor, who had two debtors. One of the debtors owed him 500 denarii, and the other owed him 50. When neither of them could pay their debt, the creditor canceled the debts for both of them. Who then will love that creditor the most? Simon answered, that one who had the most forgiven. And Jesus said to him, you have judged correctly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven because she has shown complete, unselfish compassion and love. But of course, the one who feels that only a little needs to have been forgiven of them, as you said, <clears throat> loves less. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. each other about all the things that were happening at that moment. As they were conversing and discussing, 
Jesus himself came near and went along the road with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, What are these words that you toss back and forth between yourselves? This made them stop walking and look gloomily at each other. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, said to Jesus, You've been visiting in Jerusalem, and you do not know what has been going on these last few days? So Jesus asked them, What? They said, The things that happened to Jesus, the Nazarene, who became a great prophet, powerful in words and works before God and all the people, to the point that our religious leaders handed him over to the judgment of death and crucified him. But we had hoped that Jesus was the one who was getting ready to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it's been three days since he died, and some women from our group got us all excited because they went out to the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find their body there, they came back speaking about having a vision of angels, saying that he lives. Some of us went to the tomb and found it to be just as the women said, but no one saw Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how misunderstanding and slow the heart is to have faith based on all that the prophets have said. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going to keep walking on but they strongly urged him to stay with them, saying, Don't go. It's getting too dark outside. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were completely opened, and they recognized him, and he was no longer seen by them. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us along the way, while he was completely opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, Adonai, the Lord, has been raised indeed, and Simon has seen him. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. So you have to excuse me for my uh, voice being a little low and deep. I was uh, having a problem with bronchitis earlier this week. It's a good thing it's Sunday. It started on Wednesday. could hardly talk on Thursday. But right now my ear is full. I don't know. I feel out of balance. So my apologies if I have to cough or sneeze. Anyway, I was wondering if you could invite anybody at all to lunch today, who would you invite? I mean, anybody in the whole world, anybody in all of history, actually, who would you invite? Now, I know it's Sunday, you're in church, it's the pastor who's asking, but don't feel any pressure to be going, oh, Jesus, of course, we've got to invite Jesus. Because i got to tell you, I would not invite Jesus. Are you kidding? I mean, when Jesus shows up, the first thing he's going to want you to do, as we heard in that reading from Luke, the seventh chapter, he's going to want you to wash his feet. And if you don't, experience is, you're going to hear about it later on in a not-so-favorable sort of way. And then forget about Jesus sitting in a chair at your table or on a bench Jesus didn't sit in chairs or tables. He's going to want some pillows to lounge on the floor to eat. And then you've got to wonder if he's going to eat at all. Because you better make sure what you've got on the table is completely kosher. Probably should stick with bread and figs and dried fruits and olives and dried fish. And put the silverware away because... Jesus didn't use forks and knives and spoons. He's going to be eating with his fingers and slurping that soup from the bowl. And don't think you're going to have a nice conversation with Jesus over lunch. I mean, the guy spoke Aramaic. 
Aramaic, it's a dead language. Nobody speaks Aramaic anymore, so you wouldn't understand a word he said. Which might not be so bad, actually, because when you reflect on what Jesus said when he was at meals, usually somebody, usually the host, was unexpectedly embarrassed. And then on the bright side, somebody else at the meal was unexpectedly shown some grace and compassion and hospitality in a way that was unexpected to the one receiving the grace and compassion and hospitality, but also in a way unexpected to the rest of the guests around the table. So you might not really want to hear what Jesus has to say. And you might not also want the kind of people he's going to bring with him at your table. So, he's not on my list. I would not be inviting Jesus to lunch today. But, you know, if you're up for it, what can I say? Go for it. Not me. Which makes me a good Lutheran, actually. Not that Lutherans would hesitate to spend time with Jesus, but it makes me a good Lutheran in that I'm also rather confident that even though I have no interest in putting Jesus on my guest list, I'm still on Jesus' guest list. Even though I'm not interested in inviting Jesus to my table to dine, Jesus invites me in a few minutes to come to his, just as I am, the mess that I am, saying and doing the unexpected and embarrassing things that I do and say, bringing the people I associate with along with me. Jesus still welcomes me. And I'm confident that Jesus will be showing me the same kind of compassion and grace and hospitality that he shows to all who answer his invitation to come, come and die. For which I say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And maybe I should just stop the sermon here while I'm standing on good gospel ground. But I'm really curious to have you think about who you would invite to lunch today, if it could be anybody. Anybody in the world, anybody in history. Because eating with people, having a meal together with people, is different than other kinds of gatherings. It's different than just having a meeting with people, or getting together to play cards, or go golfing. I mean, why is it that families get together for a meal on special occasions? Why is it that there's a reception after a wedding? Why is going out to dinner on a date still kind of a big deal? Why is it that friends do lunch? Why is it that if someone's missing from the dinner table, they're maybe saying something pretty significant? Or they're really missed in a way that is more significant than any time else during the day, other than perhaps going to bed or getting up. There's something special about gathering for a meal around a table. Which is why I think that Jesus spends so much time at meals around tables with folks. I mean, he eats with friends. He eats with people who are not his friends. And he eats with people who nobody wants to be friends with. And he does that a lot. And when he does this, unexpected things happen. I mean, every time that Jesus does this, unexpected things happen. To me, one of the most unexpected things is that, did you ever notice Jesus never gets thrown out of dinner? Despite the fact that he's usually saying something unexpectedly embarrassing about the host, or unexpectedly challenging to the people around the table, even though he's bringing people that no one would expect to have around the table. He doesn't get thrown out, ever. And yet, every time that Jesus has a meal, everyone at the table is challenged. Everyone at the table has a change in their experience and perspective on life. Just like these two disciples in the story we read this morning. And yes, as I said, we are back on Easter. 
even though you are completely done with Easter, even our lilies are wilting here. But in the church, we're still stuck on Easter Day. Is it any wonder why people think we're behind the times in so many ways? But here on Easter evening, we hear about a dinner. Though it's not really a story about much of a dinner, is it? It's kind of a lead-up to dinner. Well, actually, a lead-up to the disciples making a decision about dinner. And the decision they have to make is, do we invite Jesus to dinner? Are we going to offer the hospitality of our table to Jesus or not? Now, have you ever thought about why they wouldn't offer their hospitality to Jesus? Of course, we know it's Jesus, so, well, you know, you would want to invite Jesus in, of course. But remember, they don't know that it's Jesus. Now, sometimes I hear people say, well, it could be dangerous. You know, he's a stranger. You don't invite strangers in. And I think, well, wait, there's two of them, and there's one of Jesus. It's kind of the other way around, right? It's more dangerous for Jesus to go and have dinner with them than for them to invite him in. I don't think it's a question of fear. I think the decision the disciples have to make is really answering the question, what's in it for us? What's in it for us to invite Jesus to have dinner? Because we have to remember that having dinner with people, inviting guests, being hospitable back in Jesus' day was a kind of a social game that people played. You invited people to dinner who you then wanted to be invited to their place for dinner in order to climb the social ladder. There was always something in it for you to invite someone to dine with you. And that's what the disciples would be wondering, Cleopas and his companion, what's in it for us? And then they'd also be wondering, is it worth it? Because being hospitable requires some sacrifice. In this case, the sacrifice is sharing something that's a valuable commodity, something that's a limited commodity, something that is the essence of life, food. Sure, we're all food secure. We've got food in abundance. If your refrigerator's empty, you go to the store, you get more. But back in Jesus' day, you know, food was something that was very, very precious. So the disciples would be wondering, Cleopas and his companion, is it worth it? You know, dividing bread in half means more bread than dividing it into three. What's in it for us? Is it worth it? It's kind of the same two questions we basically ask when we're deciding about whether to be hospitable in some way or not. What's in it for us? And is it worth it? Is it worth us becoming vulnerable? Is it worth us making a sacrifice of our time, our resources, opening ourselves to something happening. Maybe I should have changed my question at the beginning of the sermon to not who would you invite to lunch today, but who wouldn't you? Who would you not welcome at your table? And darn, I said Jesus already, didn't I? Hmm. Well, let's take just a quick look at the end of this story, well, the, the penultimate scene in the story, the one before the guys go crazy and run all the way back to Jerusalem, the one where Jesus comes in, because fortunately they decide it's worth it, and there is something in it for them. So Jesus comes in and sits at the table, and then an amazing thing happens. Jesus breaks the bread. Yeah, I know. Big deal, right? Jesus breaks it. No, you got to remember something about bread. Bread, back in Jesus' day, was probably baked maybe once every two weeks because heating up your little oven meant you had to have fuel, which was something not easy to come by and also expensive. So at home, you may make bread once every two or three weeks. And then when you made it, you made a bunch of loaves and then you dried it in the sun. 
and bread was generally eaten with being dipped in olive oil or wine because it was hard. To hear that Jesus picks up the loaf and breaks it means that it's fresh bread. This is the best bread. What the disciples have given to Jesus, what they're sharing with him, is first-class bread, the best that they could have had. And then it's really remarkable that Jesus breaks the bread. The guest breaks the bread. Now, when I was growing up at my grandparents' house, if you were the one who took the big chocolate chip cookie and broke it, it was the other person who got to decide which piece was theirs, right? Because there's a risk in having the guest break the bread. But then in the midst of this kind of radical hospitality, this hospitality which offers the best that can be offered, which then makes the guest the host, in the midst of this kind of radical hospitality, Cleopas and his companion unexpectedly find joy. They unexpectedly receive understanding. They unexpectedly are renewed for life. Which is what happens when we answer Jesus' invitation to come. Jesus offers us that same hospitality around his table in the breaking of the bread. We become vulnerable to being unexpectedly the recipient of joy. Unexpectedly the recipient of understanding and renewed life. And then we're sent out to reshape and reinterpret our own sense of hospitality. So let me ask you, if you could invite anybody to lunch today, who would it be?
confess our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Set free from the captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, the people in need, and of all creation. Holy One of new beginnings, fill us with new life. Send us into the world as you sent your apostles to invite people to come and see your wondrous acts in Christ. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Revive ecosystems along coast, coastlands that have been dev devastated by natural forces or human negligence. Reestablish plant and animal life that purifies our air and water and feeds all living creatures. God, in your mercy. Amen. Accompany all who get little rest and little comfort in this world. Give them hope in their struggle. Give all who labor fair treatment and just wages. As Christ cared for sinners, help us to reach out to all in our community. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sheltering God, sustain and strengthen all who support vulnerable people across the world. We especially pray for the people of the Ukraine that this war might end and healing might begin. Empower government agencies to provide the ref for refugees and immigrants forced to leave their homelands. Encourage the people of the world to care and accept these displaced people wherever they may come from. Merciful God. Hear our prayer. Restore all people who cry to you for help. Turn your mourning into joy and put a testimony of healing and praise on their lips. We trust in your promises of presence and compassion, and so we bring before you now those in our lives who are on our hearts and minds. And we ask that you hear the prayers we humbly ask for ourselves. Send us as your healing presence in places of hunger, pain, illness, or overwhelming sorrow. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Join our voices with angels, creatures, and all the saints praising Christ and bestowing upon him all blessing and honor and glory. Reveal Christ's glory to us through our worship. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. It is into your hands, O oh Lord, that we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Also with you.
your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. And so we give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all that was necessary for our salvation. It was he who, in the night he was handed over, took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for my remembrance. Then after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for my remembrance. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for and ever. Amen.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Lord, for renewing and refreshing our bodies and souls with the bread of grace, the wine of reconciliation, the fellowship of faithful friends, and the word of radical enlightenment. As we go back out now to the joys and trials, the tasks and tedium, the wonder and worry that is life, sustain us with your spirit. May we fully digest our feasting on this bread, wine, fellowship, and word that will be nurtured to remain consistently faithful to all that we say and do, that around us and that all around us will see and know that we are yours. We ask this in the name of the one who gave his life that we may live, Jesus the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs> Yesterday, the book sale raised uh, $822.50, which was uh, graciously matched, so we're at uh, 
$1,645 at this point, which is wonderful. Uh, so uh, don't miss out. There's lots of good stuff there. And Sunday school at 945 in here. Yes, yeah, Sunday school, 945 here. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.